Hi, Ayan. Welcome back. <laughs> Hi, Claudia. Good to be back again. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for taking the time. I know you are pretty busy these days in your practice. and um, Always have time for this. So. This is good. Yeah. How's it going? How is practice going? I guess we're one year into like the lockdowns and I know you're working, you're working primarily online. Yeah. So starting on March 23rd, 2020. So it's like little more than a year now that I went full online and, um, and it has worked really well. And, uh, you know, I'm still able to do EMDR and things like that online. And so much so that in November, I let go of my physical clinic. Um, and now I actually have quite a few clients from uh, other parts of Ontario, like even like London, Ottawa. So yeah, I'm, I'm actually thinking of not going back to the clinic maybe ever again, because a lot of my clientele are no longer Toronto and GTA. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. People always ask me what my plans are. And I think it's too soon to tell. I want to wait until things settle and then decide. But I miss acupuncture. But I think in your case, it's a lot of... Um, like you can do EMDR online using video, right? So no. there's not necessarily a reason to be. And that, you know, just even the way that um, the added stress of someone having to commute and get there on time and pay for parking and the uncertainty of how to get there, all that stuff kind of adds to, it adds a barrier to someone accessing. Yeah, and, and I also feel how effective it is to do therapy with masks and that, you know, that plastic thing that people put in their faces, the visor. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, the, yeah, I don't think I can do that. Like mm-hmm. you can barely see the person's face and they're talking and you don't, uh, is that person crying or is they, are they not crying? You know, like, what's mm-hmm. going on? You know, it makes it much harder. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you come uh, somewhere how, with a camera. Yeah, I don't know how the people, therapists who are doing in person now, yeah, kudos to them. I don't know how they're doing it. Uh, but yeah, I would find it very hard to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I felt like too. It just felt like it was easier just to simplify. I mean, life feels very different, right? It, it, like I'm I'm noticing it's harder to go out to do things, like to do errands and tasks. It's just not part of our routine anymore. So it seems just a lot more convenient to stay home and work. And mm-hmm. I think it's more convenient for for my patients too. And then, like you said, now you can see people all over Ontario. So now people aren't necessarily local within a 10 kilometer radius type thing like they were before. So it, yeah. So you'll never be able to um, be local to all your current clients now anyways. So, um, and that's good. I think, cause it helps people find the right person for them in, you know, within their province um, and that could be with like any practitioner in the province versus the person that's near them, you know, picking yeah. from the three that are on the street that you're looking at. So this is all good stuff, I think. And yeah. how have things changed? Like, how has, has your practice, like the, the, the kind of clients or the, the issues that clients are dealing with, has that shifted in the last year? Um, not so much because uh, as, I, as you know, I'm dealing with mostly my bread and butter is mostly complex trauma, PTSD, dissociative disorders. Um, so those uh, situations are such that COVID, of course, can make things worse. Some cases, COVID actually made things better. There are clients who are like, uh, you know, um, and now I don't really feel pressure to go out. Um, mm-hmm. Where certain clients are like, you know, I didn't want to see my, say, uh, you know, family of origin, for example. Now, because of COVID, I'm no longer pressured to go for these family gatherings anymore. So I don't get as triggered while some others are feeling more isolated, lonely, Mm -hmm. um, that stuff. But given that my issue, the work things that I was working with, um, um, so it hasn't now, it hasn't really changed as much. It just makes it a bit harder with COVID. And I know that, you know, we will be uh, speaking about polyvagal at some point. And this is something that I was uh, discussing with one of my mentors, whose name is Ariel Schwartz. She's one of, uh, she's a, like a pretty uh, famous in the world of EMDR and somatic psychology. She's based out of Boulder, Colorado. And one of our group supervision sessions, uh, she was talking about how um, when we keep communicating over Zoom, um, that ventral vagal faculty 
the ventral vagal system, which is all about like, um, you know, uh, co-regulation and talking to someone and just like, you know, that uh, interaction with someone that how um, that can get a bit affected in the sense that uh, you're not in someone's energy, energetic field, you're not in someone's, um, you know, um, electromagnetic field in a way and Mm -hmm. you can't see their full body. So it's like, you know, that's kind of the reason why you get that Zoom fatigue. And initially that was a big concern for me because I used to be able to do five, six sessions a day and be okay with it. And initially three sessions, four sessions, and I'm like, you know, I'm turning into mush at Mm -hmm. the end of it. Uh, But over time I've been able to develop, you know, go back to my five, six sessions. But uh, yeah, it can be hard. And for those who are working office jobs or uh, teaching jobs or things like that, where they have to be on Zoom meetings all day, yeah, it can be pretty rough on their nervous system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I think, yeah, we talked about this at the beginning of transitioning online where you were mentioning that it's like you almost have to put more energy into the ventral vagal, safe and social and co-regulation cues. Yeah to establish that safety versus just holding the space. Like you have to like watch what your face is signaling, how your voice, like there's fewer cues. So those cues have to all be coherent and intentional. Um, Yeah. I feel like that, like even in group sessions, how we participate is different. You know, you don't see the faces of people when you're speaking it's hard to decide when to talk. Sometimes there's a lag. And so there's an interruption and there's these different things that definitely impact our sense. Even this thing of like um, parallel play where you can just sort of sit with somebody, whether it's a friend or even a, you know, a client or a patient where there's a silence, like a silence means something different now, you know? Because you're like face to face, you're not really making eye contact. Because I'm looking at your photo, not not the camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Same here. I'm looking at your photo right now to see. Uh, then yeah, so the, yeah. the eye contact piece becomes mm-hmm. kind of weird as well. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, like you don't see the whites of the eyes. Yeah. So, can you? Okay, let's talk about your practice. So, trauma. We have a podcast with you on trauma. Like it's one of our early, the early episodes, like episode three or something. You were like one of the um OGs of the Good Mood podcast. Yeah. <laughs> and we talked about yeah, trauma and how it works in the brain and EMDR and all these good things. And then we've talked polyvagal, but not with you. But maybe we can start there because I think that's a useful like why were you drawn to polyvagal in the context of trauma? Sure. Um, so first thing I want to say is um, you know, that in in my practice, I I don't have a huge focus on somatic work. Like, you know, um, there are a lot of therapists who, um, you know, have studied kind of, you know, either somatic experiencing, sensory motor psychotherapy, or some kind of a major uh, somatic modality. Um, In my case, that is one of my, you know, um, sort of growing edges, like something that I want to do more. But I, I, I haven't really, I don't have like a big focus on somatics even though EMDR can have a component of, you know, somatic work. And um, to that extent, I can deal with it. I can work with it. Um, but um, I wouldn't consider myself like an expert on like somatic psychology and things like that. So just, you know, putting that as a caveat at the beginning. Um, uh, polyvagal came to me, um, um, yeah, through the work of dissociation, actually. Because uh, when, uh, so dissoci- dissociation came to me when I started doing EMDR. So when you start doing memory work with someone, um, very quickly you will see clients who are not able to access memories, who are able to be like, um, oh, you know, yeah, this happened to me, that happened to me. But then I, when I asked them, okay, now when you go to the memory, how does that feel? They're like, I don't feel anything. Or they feel way too much, where they are like just, small image or something and they're like you know are destabilizing so that's when uh, emdr uh people who have trained in emdr then start getting interested in dissociation they're like oh why is that happening why is this person you know why can i do memory work with this one and not be able to do memory work with that person answer is dissociation and then you get to go down the you know you take the the red pill of dissociation and kind of go down that rabbit hole 
Uh, you think that air that you're breathing, that kind of a thing with dissociation. <laughs> Um, and then dissociation, you then start looking at it as a bit of a somatic place. And then you hear about the dorsal vagal. I was like, what is the dorsal vagal? You know, uh, sounds kind of cool. And, you know, like, I don't know about it. So let me check it's it like out. Like a dorsal fin. Yeah. yeah, it's like dorsal vagal. Sounds very medical, you know, it has a, has a, heavy, has a heaviness to it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, that's how, you know, I, I got into polyvagal. Um, I read... Um, uh, Deb Dana's, I read the Stephen Porges book, um, Deb Dana's um, uh, polyvagal book. And there's another, uh, which is actually really practical by a person named Stanley Rosenberg. He's mm-hmm. actually an osteopath who has created, uh, I keep forgetting the name of the book. It's like healing through the polyvagal theory or something like that. Um, and uh, the book is great in the sense that a lot of typically polyvagal theory type books have a big focus on just the uh, sort of the psychological aspect of it, you know, uh, and the, and the um, you know, sort of how to improve your ventral vagal and all that. There's a big focus on, uh, yeah, you know, interacting with someone, talking to someone. While this guy, Stanley Rosenberg, because he's an osteopath, he has, he created, he discovered uh, physical exercises that you can do. So he has the basic exercise, which is like, you know, you kind of like, get your hands like this, put it behind kind of like your occipital lobe, that area. And, um, you know, you're holding for 30 to 60 seconds. You're putting, you're looking to one ex- one corner of your eye, you can blink and you're looking like that for 30 to 60 seconds. And then do the same thing on the other side, 30 to 60 seconds. Mm-hmm. So it's the basic exercise by Stanley Rosenberg activates a lot of, uh, you know, because as you know, eyes take up a lot of a neural, uh, you know, real estate and connected to the ventral vagal. So it helps to activate the ventral vagal. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, really recommend that book. Lots of physical exercises there. Mm. That's so um, cool. Yeah. yeah. So basically what you were just for anyone who's not watching the video, which you should probably watch this video on YouTube because we're going to have some images later, but it's like hands interlaced and then the palms resting on the back of your head, almost like you're lying in a hammock type thing. Yeah. And then looking to the very corner, like sideways, keeping your head still, right? That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I'm always looking for, because people, when they learn, we'll talk polybagal, but people, the question people always ask is, how do I yeah. ascend the ladder? Like, what do you recommend? Yeah. You know? Exactly. So exactly. this is helpful. Yeah. And, and then when you say that, oh, you know, interact with someone and uh, safe and secure, but like with, with clients who are not, who have complex trauma, who have trust issues, who are isolated because of COVID, how do they do the ventral vagal then, right? Like, so yeah. that's why some of these ex- physical exercises can be quite helpful in climbing the ladder by yourself, where you're not needing someone else um, mm-hmm. to get into the ventral vagal. But... Yeah, exactly. Like I, I struggle with that too, where I have been recommending Deb Dana's book, but I think I might recommend Stanley Rosenberg's now to parents. I see a lot of youth and the parents are really who bring them in. And it's hard to work with youth sometimes with developing skills. Like that's part of it. But another part is like, especially for the concerned parents is like when your child's having a panic attack or is, um, you know, becoming aggressive and having a tantrum, what can you do in those moments with your energy, you know, to make, to, to help that person regulate? So I'm, I'm recommending books a lot to the family members <laughs> just because I'm like, you know, I can tell the nine-year-old or the 17-year-old how to deep breathe all I want, but it's tough. It's tough for a nine-year-old to catch themselves and start deep breathing like it's it's not as realistic as giving a parent some tools you know at least yeah. i i thought yeah. um yeah. yeah can can we talk about polyvagal like what it is and we have sure. another podcast but i think you have a good diagram that i yeah. use in my client sessions nice. i was telling you yeah so, uh would it be okay if i shared it here um shared mm-hmm. the diagram yeah. yeah and for podcast listeners you also will put a link to your Instagram, which is where a lot of these images are too. Um, but they can also check the YouTube video out for the, we'll put the link for the YouTube as well. 
Yeah, and and I'll speak through the diagram. So even for listeners who don't have a visual, you know, you kind of get you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. let's bring that up here. Okay, let me know if you can see mm -hmm. my screen. Okay. Looks good. All right, so we're gonna zoom in here a little bit. Okay. Now I'm on a you know on a on a show with uh with someone who knows the physiology better than I do. So, you know, uh, when I explain the physiology part, you know, take it with a grain of salt, I'm not a medical professional. Um, okay, so how I like to, and I, I'll explain it the way I typically explain to my um, psychotherapy clients, you know, when we do psychoeducation. Okay, um, all right, so on here you see, um, three pathways going in and I typically like to start with the sympathetic because that's the thing that most people are very familiar with. Uh, so sympathetic is go, this red, uh, you know, line here, which is going along your spinal column. Um, and uh, this is the fight flight version of your nervous system. So we're talking only about autonomic nervous system, you know, things that, you know, take control of your body by itself. You don't have that much you do have some amount of conscious control, but not as much. Mm -hmm. um, and um, fight flight, essentially mobilization of energy uh, located along the spinal cord and mobilizes the body to fight or run away from danger, increased heart rate, tense muscles, fast, shallow breathing. Okay, middle of the regulatory and evolutionary ladder. Okay, um, one thing that we also want to look at is. Um, you know, sympathetic and dorsal vagal both have two, two modes. One is with fear and without fear, right? And so um, right here in your mid, you know, in your midbrain, you'll have the amygdala, which is kind of like your brain's uh, smoke alarm. Uh, it's like uh, the danger detector. You know, are we safe or are we dangerous? Uh, are we in danger? Uh, and so sympathetic, you can have two modes with fear, without fear. So for example, if you're running on the treadmill, that is still sympathetic activation, but that's without fear. But now if someone's running with a knife after you, you are running, uh, but now that's with fear. So with fear, without fear. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. um, then we have uh, the vagus nerve, which is a cranial nerve, cranial nerve number 10, starting from the brainstem area. And it has two branches that are coming in. So we'll look at for the blue branch. Okay, the blue branch goes all the way down here. Uh, and it's primarily located uh, sub-diaphragmatic. So below the diaphragm here, you have some in your heart area, but mostly in sub-diaphragmatic. So stomach uh, and lower abdomen, that area, right? And, um, you know, when it's not in defense mode, it has a lot of, you know, a lot of different tasks and jobs that it does, especially around digestion and things like that. But when it goes into defense mode, its focus is on immobilization. So things like uh, freeze, collapse, dissociate. Okay, so it's a collapse in mobilization. Uh, location, diaphragm, heart, gut area. Shut off from the threat and can't fight for flight. Decreased heart rate, low energy, depressed, numb, shut down. Hmm. And it's the bottom of the regulatory and evolutionary ladder. Okay, um, and once I talk about the ventral vagal, I'll also quickly speak about what does this mean, bottom of the regulatory and evolutionary ladder, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is the part which, um, you know, helps to shut things down. This is depression, this is uh, dissociation. Um, and this again comes with two modes, uh, you know, with fear, without fear. So for example, when you are going to sleep and you're about to fall asleep and you have a little bit of that, that in that stage when you're consciously, your conscious mind has kind of gone to sleep and your body's starting to go to sleep, you have that state of sleep paralysis, um, all of that. That again is dorsal vagal. The dorsal vagal parasympathetic essentially is bringing on that uh, immobilization. Uh, but if you're sleeping normally, sleeping okay, then that immobilization is coming without any fear. So the amygdala is not activated, there's no fear, and you're just going to sleep. Mm. Um, while depression, you know, and this is where I'm extrapolating a little bit as well, depression can be looked at as sleep but with fear, sleep but with some kind of um, a fear-based activation, you know, and the fear can be in the form of hopelessness, nothing's going to change, that kind of submit mode. And that's why you see in depression, one can be sleeping hours and hours, 12 hours of sleep, and yet feel tired, yet feel like they haven't gone to sleep. 
It's because dorsal vagal is doing its thing, but amygdala is switch, still switched on. So the body is in this weird state of um, immobilization, but also not fully relaxed. Immobilization, but not calm. Immobilization, but not relaxed, mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, mm -hmm. This is like the possum that plays, that possum, like exactly. freezes when it's under threat. Yeah, yeah, and I'll speak about that in a moment. The, the mm -hmm. possum thing is a good, good piece. The, uh, thing, the, yeah. the third one is the ventral vagal. Okay, that's the green section. So it's mostly, uh, it's called the, the face heart connection where you're, you're, a lot of the nervous endings are in your face, eyes, um, you know, cheekbones around your mouth and your, around your throat uh, and into your heart area, okay? And this is your social engagement network, location, face, throat, chest, uh, ability to talk, engage, co-regulate, self-soothe and remain calm. And it's the top of the regulatory and evolutionary ladder. Okay, so speaking a little bit about regulatory and evolutionary ladder, evolutionary ladder is uh, dorsal vagal is the most, um, you know, is the most primal part for autonomous nervous system and something that, uh, you know, organisms and animals that are lower in the evolutionary hierarchy, say, for example, certain reptilians, the possum, for example, um, they, uh, or I think even maybe the tortoise, uh, I'm not sure, but like, for example, a tortoise doesn't go attacking other people, uh, you know, other animals when it's in threat. It goes into that kind of hiding mode, right? Mm -hmm. So that hiding mode, that collapse, um, is the dorsal vagal and is the most primary. Even when, uh, if you've seen a video of like a, you know, a lion, lioness, um, you know, um, after a successful chase, has like a, you know, gazelle uh, between her teeth. Now the gazelle is not dead already. The gazelle is actually in a dorsal vagal full shutdown because the, the organism has realized that I can't fight this. I can't fight or flight my way out of it. And uh, the, the body just pumps, uh, the nervous system and pumps the body with opioids to just like get kind of like getting ready to die kind of a thing to make it as painless as possible. Um, and that's the most primal uh, part of our system. That's why it's at the bottom of the evolutionary ladder. Sympathetic is something on top of that, you know, animals that have learned to fight or flight their way out of it. So it's kind of the middle of the evolutionary ladder. And then we have ventral vagal, which is at the top because it's more of a, um, it's, it's a part of a defense mechanism as well, but it's, the, it's survival uh, in a herd, survival in a tribe, right? So as mammals started to evolve and as they started to find uh, safety in numbers, um, it was like, okay, safety numbers requires the different members in the herd or tribe to be able to kind of get along with each other, to be able to kind of communicate with each other. And ventral vagal came up as an evolutionary requirement for that, that how do I now communicate with the rest of my tribe so that we can all get along and so that, you know, we can get the safety of numbers, right? Because if I was a caveman and if I get ostracized by my tribe and have to now fend for myself in the forest by myself, I don't think I'll survive too many days by myself, mm -hmm. right? And so ventral vagal is essentially another, another form of survival mechanism, just that survival in a tribe or a herd. And it's the top of the evolutionary ladder because of that. Mm -hmm. This is like a way our nervous system perceives and responds to threat or lack of threat. like. I, I use the analogy, you can tell me if this is a good one of like, so it's like deer in a field at the edge of the woods eating grass and they're all, they start off in their ventral vagal, they're all together, they're like peaceful. And then one of them senses something and sort of stops mm -hmm. and then sees a wolf coming out of the woods. Mm -hmm. And then they start dropping down the ladder, activate their flight, they're sympathetic. They start running. One of them gets caught by the wolf, starts mm -hmm. to fight. So they're st still dropping the ladder and they now activate to, to struggle to get away. They don't succeed. And then they, they descend even further to dorsal vagal where they essentially enter this like submission to be yeah. eaten. And then if they end up somehow, if that deer gets away somehow miraculously or the wolf, I don't know, someone like scares the wolf off, the deer starts to ascend the ladder. And I think you're, you'll talk about this too, what it looks like to ascend and descend. With that, I don't know. Is that a good picture of yeah? That's that's a, a perfect picture of how that happens. Uh, perfect picture of how that happens. Um, yeah, that's the descent. 
Uh, and the ascent in that deer scenario, what would happen is um, this is something that animals can do, but we humans, because of our bigger brains, have a hard time doing. Uh, because there was some research, I'm not, not huge into you know, figuring out where I get the research from. I just hear about it here and there. <laughs> One of the research elements is looking at, I think, I think Peter Levine was doing that as to like, why, why uh, do wild animals, even after, you know, having like an attack by a wolf or something, why do wild animals have lesser cases of PTSD-like symptoms as compared to say domesticated animals, right? So for, for example, abused dog has PTSD-like symptoms, but that deer, that's very traumatic to be chased by a wolf or a lion, uh, but why are they not having PTSD-like symptoms afterwards? Uh, and one of the things is, um, as they ascend from sympathetic to ventral vagal, there is an element of um, discharging. There's an element of discharging excess energy built in the nervous system. Because sympathetic essentially causes a lot of energy to get built in the system for fighting or running away. And, um, and when the fight or flight is done successfully afterwards, there is still an element of shaking. You know, there's a so the deer, what's it, what, what it's going to do is going to go back, join its herd, and then find a safe space within the herd where they can go and just like shake, shake it out. They go through shivering and shaking and excess sympathetic energy gets released. Uh, and then they're able to ascend into ventral vagal uh, pretty easily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and which like, you know, if someone's having panic, they might it's like perceived as something it's, it's it sort of worsens the state of panic because they're they're experiencing this involuntary shaking that is very unpleasant it's sort of like the rapid heartbeat um and sometimes like we'll say like therapeutic shaking like preemptive shaking could be helpful if you feel a panic attack coming on just shake it out yeah to, yeah and that's interesting that um um that, that nature has that built in also like i think i don't know if you remember this story where it was like analyzing who ends up getting ptsd or not and it was almost like the people that froze or felt ineffective were more likely to get ptsd versus the ones so i think there's an example of like a school bus mm -hmm. um accident with a bunch of kids and the kids that that somehow were still mobile, that they were still in that mobilization state and were able to open windows or sort of help their other yeah. um, fellow classmates didn't experience PTSD. Whereas the ones that felt ineffective and trapped yeah. had more PTSD. It's almost like yeah. when you stay in that sympathetic during a crisis, you're more likely to maybe not feel stuck in that state afterwards. Yeah, um, true, I, I agree and I, and I tell, clients as well that um, even with something like muggings or even with like sexual assault, for example, uh, if a person in a sexual assault is able to kind of fight back and get away, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to shake them up, but it's not going to cause like nightmares three months later so much. While uh, if they're not able to fight back, um, that's when the collapse dorsal vagal thing comes in. And that's when often higher chance that it becomes like PTSD or problematic later on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to mention is uh, in what we see in a lot of now coming into it from a mental health point of view, a lot, what we see quite a bit is this uh, cycling of sympathetic and dorsal vagal. Uh, and that cycling is like this. It's like, you know, someone is feeling really depressed can't get out of bed, okay, like really depressed. Um, and then they start doing something. So what needs to happen is for them to climb the ladder, they need, uh, instead of ventral, a lot of people think that, okay, for me to get out of dorsal vagal, I need to go straight into ventral vagal. But actually, no, you need a little bit of sympathetic. You need to activate and mobilize energy. That's why it's through the ladder. Um, and then what starts to happen is if they start mobilizing the energy, uh, but the mobilization happens too quickly, like the spike in energy happens uh, too quickly, or the mind perceives it as an internal trigger uh, or something like that, then quickly the amygdala can get switched on 
and this sympathetic instead of it being a gentle sympathetic becomes turns into anxiety or, or panic or something like that and so then they experience that and the body is like you know what we can't deal with this panic and heightened sympathetic for too long it's not good for the body it's not good for the organs too much blood pressure what not and so then the body then decides to shut it down and the person then switches back into goes into dorsal vagal again so climb the ladder up to sympathetic back to dorsal vagal up to sympathetic back to dorsal vagal and that's why often you have that anxiety depression comorbidity where a person is cycling through those two modes mm. uh, through the day yeah makes sense yeah, yeah so they're like switching between panic and collapse panic yeah, and depression panic and collapse. yeah or panic yeah. and dissociation yeah mm-hmm. yeah and so one thing that i would recommend then is where we want to do sympathetic in a very um in a very gentle way as possible so this is where uh, when their dorsal vagal collapse this is where that stanley rosenberg book comes really ha- handy because uh, he talks about a bunch of physical exercises that directly engages the ventral vagal and also is a gentle sympathetic so gentle stretching gentle sympathetic uh where we want to engage the sympathetic without activating the amygdala without going into a with fear mode so we want sympathetic without fear uh and start going into ventral vagal and then you know go into ventral vagal mm-hmm. we're talking about that in my in my group program for the movement week we're mm-hmm. talking about like we frame it differently like yin exercise and yang exercise so yin's more of like you're in more of a um, dorsal vagal state. So this is the person who's like feeling exhausted, maybe going for a run or doing like high intensity interval training yeah. is going to be too stimulating. Yeah. And often when you, you may not even be in a, in a fear-based dorsal vagal state, but you just, you start to do that exercise and feel lightheaded and yeah. it's nauseous and just really not good. And, um, and you don't feel revived or, or, or peaceful or happy after the exercise. You don't get that sort of endorphin thing. And so we talk about like, okay, more yoga or more walking or something calming, but still yeah. movement-based uh, versus the more yang exercise, which is like, yeah, high intensity interval, which can kind of dis- dis- disperse and clear some of that pent up energy. Like yeah. I think of, you know, my cousin, it's like, I always use her as an example, but she's, was like, yeah, like bad when she was a kid. There's a podcast episode with her, The Way of the Warrior. But when growing up, she was like bad. She was always getting in trouble. She's tons of energy, hyperactive, and now is a professional martial artist who is expending extreme amounts of energy and is now very calm. And it's like a way for her to kind of clear some of that. Um, It's like she's like doing daily shaking, you know? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So... So this is interesting. Like this is another sort of way to superimpose that idea. Like we were talking about in the context of adrenals and, but I think, you know, our hormonal system is involved in all of this as well. Yeah. 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 Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And some of the things that can be done in ventral vagal is, uh, you know, massaging off like around the eye socket, back of the neck. That's good. Mm -hmm. Um, singing and toning is amazing. So if, mm-hmm. if you are a singer, uh, just singing, you know, bathroom singing to your favorite tunes or even toning where um, you can just do like vowels or uh, incense, somatic experiencing. Peter Levine talks about uh, saying Voom, so V-O-O-M. So just going like Voom, like that mm-hmm. and just doing a bunch of that in the morning um, because a lot of you know, um, mm. retrovagal nerve endings are there. Like um, gargling or ujjayi breath, right? The yeah. yoga breath, yeah. <laughs> yoga breath, all that, all that is uh, really good stuff uh, to activate retrovagal. Another thing I wanted to mention is um, something that I tell my clients is this thing that about uh, vagal tone. Vagal tone is like, um, it's like muscle tone, right? Think of it this way that uh, if you're really used to being in dorsal vagal sympathetic, if you are used to cycling in that way, um, in your, uh, if you use the anal- analogy, your ventral vagal is like this really skinny guy and your sympathetic and dorsal vagal are these really, you know, built up guys. Okay. And then the brain is like, okay, 
we got all this stress who can lift this weight okay sympathetic and dorsal vagus are like let me do it look at our muscles let me do it we we are you know we've been doing this all the time uh, the the tone of my sympathetic and dorsal vagal is very high because they get used all the time and so um what that does is it makes the ventral vagal not as sticky which means that even when a client is in a ventral vagal state um the moment there is a little bit of stress that's coming in um the more uh the the it's like it's like if you're doing if you're doing deadlifts and if you uh don't have that much strength or tone in your quads and your hams and that kind of stuff um you're going to start using different parts of your back now you want to use a bit of your uh lower back for deadlifts but not like a lot of it but now you're starting to use upper back and arms and all kinds of stuff um and that's going to cause problems because other parts of your body is now trying to compensate for certain weaknesses so the same thing happens that so the weakness of the ventral vagal then starts to get compensated by sympathetic and dorsal vagal and that's why initially with my complex trauma clients when we when i give them the exercises and all that they'll say that oh yeah when i when i do them it feels nice but half an hour later an hour later i'm back to feeling whatever you know anxious or depressed so i believe that the exercise don't really work you know and i say that no it's not that the exercise don't work is that because your ventral vagal is not getting used as much it doesn't have a very good tone in the sense it's it's weak muscles in a way right and uh, the exercises that you're doing are a way to kind of improve your ventral vagal tone so that when some stressors come in uh, your ventral vagal is not just easily handing it off to sympathetic or dorsal vagal that the ventral vagal is a bit more sticky is able to hold uh, that stressor uh, before handing it off to the more defensive parts of your nervous system. You would be like keep the ping pong ball moving. Yeah. You know. Yeah, keep it there, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think is this the 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 uh vagal break when they talk about that is like applying the vagal break. Or yeah, the the vagal break uh the vagal break um yeah, the vagal break is essentially this idea that when you're in sympathetic or dorsal vagal your body is uh I you know pressing on the accelerator. uh in the sense that it's all about survival um uh, i think deb dana has this analogy where uh, i think deb dana or, or janina fisher i'm not quite sure uh they have this thing where uh, they look at it as a house thing so think of it if this was a house dorsal vagal is your basic you know you're just turning on your furnace just enough to maintain i don't know 18 degrees or something like that so if you were for example leaving the house and going somewhere else uh dorsal vagal is the basic amount of plumbing heat uh electricity that you need to keep a house running right uh, sympathetic then is your alarms and your door locks and things like that uh and the ventral vagal is what makes a house a home ventral vagal is the all that all that intangible thing that makes a house a home the decoration the warmth in the place etc right mm-hmm. uh and so if you only live in dorsal vagal or sympathetic you're essentially living in that kind of a em- cold empty house uh which is not yet a home and mm-hmm. ventral vagal is what makes that house a home yeah and that's a, so interesting cuz people will use certain language i think deb dana says this story follows state um which is the total opposite of cognitive behavior therapy which is that your story or your thoughts cause you to feel a certain way which i think is true but we're like looking at different parts of the circle <laughs> you know but so she's like there's different things people will say depending on where they are on the ladder so yeah like i feel empty i feel hopeless i feel tired shut down versus i feel like stressed or i feel like alarm or you know versus and some people will say things like oh when i do this thing i feel like i'm home mm-hmm. or i feel you know safe and social right but there are these certain phrases that will come up um that will kind of alert you to where someone is on the ladder and then you know will sort of indicate like what activities make them feel a certain way yeah, yeah. exactly and i think i think uh, this is where polyvagal can be quite helpful even if it's not being used so much in the session but like 
um, you know, this idea that if I'm in dorsal vagal, meditation may not be the best thing because meditation again is kind of parasympathetic. Or um, if I am in, if I'm feeling anxious, doing more exercise may not be the best thing. You know, all around. so kind of knowing like where am I? These are my tools, and where am I at in the ladder? Which tools go best with which? Um, you know, um, stuff like that. So I, I think that's where um, if you are, say, for example, with one of your patients, and um, you know you're not doing psychotherapy with them. Um, and you're not using uh, somatic psychology, nor are you doing like, you know, chiropractic things or anything like that, nor are you doing massage. Um, so it's like, how can I give them something um, that helps them, that uses this concept that helps them, even though we are not doing so much of that in our session. And I think helping patients and clients kind of track where they are at on the ladder, mm-hmm. uh, that's a big thing. And uh, and then the piece of okay, which exercise or which coping mechanism works best for where you're at, you know, on the ladder. Yeah, like yeah, Deb Dana has a lot of cool exercises, like making a pie chart mm-hmm. for every day, deciding how much percentage of the day was spent in each state, or yeah. noticing and naming, which is helpful. Like just starting there, mm-hmm. and then coming up with like words and phrases that might indicate what state or, you know, what, what would I say about, um, like when I'm in dorsal vagal, I am, the world is, other people are, and then finishing the sentence. So there's these different, um, ways that she helps people kind of engage with the theory and, and relate it back to their own experience and see it from that lens. It's nice because it's this idea, there's a podcast called stuck, not broken. And, you know, it's helpful to, I like it because we're not seeing as it, it, it as a medical condition. We're seeing it as this dynamic flow of energy and that is built into our nervous system, but that we just might be stuck at a certain level more, you know, more often than, um, yeah. you know, or we're not able to flow as dynamically through the ladder, you know, yeah. um, yeah, which is helpful. I think the important thing also, which we sometimes overlook when we try to hyper focus on the ventral vagal, is that the sympathetic and dorsal vagal are not our enemies. It's not like, oh, those are, if I'm in the dorsal vagal, oh, poor me, I'm always in the dorsal vagal. Like, you know, I don't know. And from a psychotherapeutic or mental health point of view, we also want to look at, okay, you know, what made, you know, when we look at all the defense mechanisms fight, flight, freeze, submit, dissociate, fawn all the defense mechanisms, uh, what is making your brain or nervous system choose uh, submit and dissociate over say fight or flight? Like why submit and dissociate over fight or flight? Mm -hmm. Um, And this is where we then start going into the childhood trauma and seeing that, okay, you know, if you had uh, more childhood trauma abuse as a child or neglect as a child, um, you couldn't fight your flight your way out of that situation. You couldn't just, you know, be a six-year-old who's like, you know what, I'm packing my bags, moving out to an Airbnb, see you parents. You know, <laughs> you, you can't quite do that. And um, and so that's when I think that submit response uh, starts to get, you know, used a lot by our nervous system and our brains. And that becomes a well-worn pathway. And so that when in adult life, now you have a lot more choice, you can actually fight or flight your way out of the situation. But the mind is like, nah, we got this. This is what we do. This is what we have been doing for the last 20 years. So we right. that. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, the person who um, doesn't ever really feel angry, yeah. you know, is tired a lot of the time. I have I have a good friend like that um, who's dealt with a lot of childhood trauma. But then also, I'm also just thinking as you're speaking of relating it to um, attachment theory, because yeah. dorsal vagal seems to kind of superimpose a little bit with avoidant attachment style and sympathetic seems to superimpose a bit with more anxious attachment style, ventral vagal, more secure attached. Just, I don't know if there's a connection, if they found a correlation, but they seem like there's this parallel kind of energy with both of them. Like avoidant is sort of, um, there's no point kind of dorsal vagal energy. Um, I'm, I'm better off alone and there's a sort of immobilization 
whereas you know anxious attachment there's lots of mobilization lots of bids for attachment and, and there can be anger there can be a high anxiety response and um but you know this sense generally of of this invariable reward of sometimes I got attachment, sometimes it didn't work out for me, this inconsistency that still keeps the person in a mobilized state throughout their life. And then ventral vagal would be just sort of like you're, you have the experience of receiving attunement and attachment when you needed it enough that it taught you what it feels like to be in ventral vagal in relation to other people. Um, do you see that in practice? Do you see like, yeah. yeah. Uh, my, my clients, a lot of them are uh, from the fourth category of disorganized attachment. So mm -hmm. disorganized, then it becomes both anxious and avoidant. This is what we see, for example, in a BPD diagnosis or something like that mm -hmm. is uh, a lot of a switch between seeking and rejecting, seeking and rejecting, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, then we can see both of those, you know, uh, at play. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in, in, in long-term healing work, I like to look at it this way, that of like kind of balancing pol polarities in the sense that for the parts of the person who are going into submit, uh, how can we help those parts go more into fight or flight? So if it was like, you know, um, I am bad, I am bad, you know, um, I was such a bad kid, this and that, like, you know, then it's like, okay, no, shifting that to be like, okay, now if that I am bad is giving you submit response, then let's uh, let's focus a bit more on angering. Let's focus a bit more. Now, a person may say that, no, but I don't want to blame my parents. They were doing the best they can, even though they were kind of abusive or neglectful. But then I say that it's not so much blaming. We just want to make sure that you start using that, you know, it's a seesaw. So you, you're way too much on this end of the seesaw. And we want to put a little bit of counterweight on the other end so that you come into balance. And so, you know, how can you anger about it? And that's the way we are activating the healthy anger. And I think for someone who's always like angry, angry, angry at the world, my parents said this, I hate them, angry, angry. Uh, we want to look at then the, the grieving, the healthy grieving aspect to be like, okay, too much weight on the fight flight. Let's put some little, not in submit, but let's put a little bit of weight on the grieving, the more dorsal vagal aspect to kind of balance it out. Well, that's, uh, yeah. I love how when a theory, so I'm more like renewed interest in it. Same with attachment theory. These, I've rejected them for so long, <laughs> but I like it when you can see through that, the lens of that theory and make sense of so many different things like, okay, grieving more of a dorsal vagal um, where this feeling people will like, cry and cry and cry until they feel just exhausted but also relieved in a sense like yeah. this whole idea of like this pro emotional processing yeah. letting letting it out um and then yeah anger can be very healthy if you're in a state of you know hopelessness self like anger can be very very productive for certain mm -hmm. individuals you know yeah. and many people experience that as being a very important stepping stone on a path to to feeling well is to feel angry at people and and um yeah and, think, and maybe I think yeah. in my line of work uh, another thing that becomes important is to kind of figure out how does a person process so if you if i get a client who cries at a drop of a hat they keep crying here and there crying 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 um then when they cry in session it doesn't mean that they're really processing anything you know, they, that's their normal state and um, uh, may not be that they may not be processing anything. So I think if we don't use that lens and if you're just like, oh, my client had a good cry in this session, so it must be that they have processed something or they've moved something, most likely not, right? Um, but if we can get that crying client to do some more angering, then I know that, okay, now some processing is happening because they're not stuck in their crying loop. This is not their go-to mechanism. This is something else is happening. So there's a higher chance that then some true processing is happening mm -hmm. versus the angry part, you know, the angry clients who are like always like angry or like, you know, seething with rage. No, doing like this, you know, screaming into pillows or, you know, hitting something with an anger back, not gonna do much for them. They can do that all day, you know? 
um, for them, that's when for them to cry a little bit is the big piece. That mm-hmm. would be the big, uh, you know, uh, sort of, you know, process thing in that case. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. It's a different, accessing a different emotional response, yeah. which would indicate like a different pathway is being opened up yeah. in that person's brain maybe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's almost like the crying in the example of the first person is just an, an, an example of dissociation, not engaging with the psychic content in that way that can help it integrate or. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would look at it this way is uh, because we have the emotional brain and the, you know, adult brain. And when someone is just going in, going into a loop, whether it's just crying or whether it's angering, it's uh, to me, it sounds like they're in that emotional brain and all the adaptive uh, new information, like I'm an adult, I can take care of myself, you know, I'm not a bad person, all that good stuff might be there in the adult brain and the neocortex, but it's not getting linked up with the emotional. They're just spinning in the emotional. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's only when the linkage happens is when we see true processing happening. Uh, and I think that's why in the older, the olden days when they did, um, emotional release kind of therapies, right? They're like, oh, let's just come here and everyone just scream in a room or like pound something. And, you know, everyone feels really good afterwards and then rinse and repeat every month. Uh, nothing really moves and you feel like you're doing a lot of work, but not really. Mm-hmm. It's because that linking is not being focused on. It's just, there's just a big focus on catharsis, but no information linking from the adult brain to the emotional brain. Mm-hmm. And if that doesn't happen, then it's like, you know then you're just yeah catharting all the time right and then you get addict, addicted to catharting because that's a big endorphin rush like a big cry or a, a right. big yelling match right that's interesting yeah like i think i saw that a lot in um in landmark mm-hmm. not to not to bash a brand yeah. but um there was this you know we see this in tony robbins in the big seminars where someone goes up in front of 600 people 1000 people has their story sort of coaxed out of them in this coaching style. And then there's this sort of moment where they, there's this almost breakdown, but there's a big, and then there's like a crying or a catharsis and there's like this, and everyone's cheering and everyone else is crying and there's a lot of energy. Um, And it seems like that person healed, but very, likely there was it was just a very big endorphin hit right because there's a huge act of courage a lot of intense stress and then it all resolves Mm -hmm. and then you get this this positive affirmation from a lot of people um but but that deeper the deeper neural connections that you're talking about the the has not necessarily been integrated and also yeah it's yeah, just sort of like this euphoric moment, um, peak experience that doesn't connect to how someone will go on with their life after that, you know? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And this is where, um, you know, as I've done more and more of this work, uh, I've realized because, you know, I have had my big ayahuasca experience in November 2019. Um, but people who are like, oh, I'm doing ayahuasca or I'm doing these things, um, because this is faster than therapy. Like, you know, often I used to have that same attitude initially when I started EMDR, uh, thinking of EMDR as a faster process that, okay, my client is coming, can I fix them in like five sessions or 10 sessions? So like faster is better kind of a thing. And I think a lot of these uh, peak experience type experiences, whether it's, you know, like Tony Robbins types, whether it's LSD, mushrooms or something like that, mm-hmm. is this thing that, oh, this is like, you know, 10 years of therapy you're doing in like one big trip, right? Yeah. Uh, but the problem then is, is that, as you mentioned, that it's the peak experience then doesn't get integrated mm-hmm. because what I'm now noticing in complex trauma work is um, there are two processes. One is the memories. One is the emotional charge associated in memories and all of that. And the other one is all the defenses and behaviors that got built around the memories uh, it's almost like a death star, you know, like all the stuff around it to protect a little core. Um, all of that that got built around it uh, to manage and maintain uh, and help the person function despite all that trauma. 
And so uh, peak experience can help to dislodge. I'm not, I'm not crapping on peak experience. That can mm-hmm. be very helpful. Uh, it can be a big way to help the person see certain things, reduce phobia or fear of the traumatic material, um, dislodge mm-hmm. uh, the mm-hmm. material a little bit, process a little bit of the memories. But unless something is being done to change, uh, disarm and lower the defenses and change the behaviors, then within, within a few months, that whole complex is built up again and the mm-hmm. person is going back to their usual ways. It's actually, yeah, a lot is coming up. I'm, I'm kind of connecting uh, things as you're speaking. Like, I think with some of these things like ayahuasca or even like a Tony Robbins thing or whatever it is, you know, a, a retreat kind of thing, it there it's sort of like you're put in this context where you you dissolve a lot of that ego or the coping stuff, the Death Star, you access the core material, but with this new coping, either the psychedelic experience or the group or whatever that effect is. And so you get to see the, the, the contents in a safer or more contained, there's a different thing around it, but then that disappears and you have your original coping ball of yarn around it. And so a lot of people will feel maybe oh, okay, I can start to now do the work because like you said, what's on the other, what's at the bottom of the cliff or the abyss is now a little bit more familiar. And so now I can start like what they they call integration work where you're starting to uh, speak about the experience, understand it. Like maybe it's going to take me 10 years to really feel like I can connect and, and, and integrate that piece that I saw. Um, But without that integration, yeah, you're just left with the same, yeah. the same like ego structure, I guess you could say it in that way, but it's really the the coping contents. Um, because you're, it's sort of, yeah, like when somebody does a, um, a, you know, goes to inpatient therapy for addiction or something like that, you know, one of the, the main challenges when they get out is that they're, they're familiar people and places and things that could trigger the addiction mm-hmm. are still there. And so even though they've worked maybe with the addictive content, it hasn't enabled them to find new coping. And that's like a really difficult transition to make. So that's interesting you brought that up because I would see that a lot. Like a lot of people who have done ayahuasca ceremony after ayahuasca ceremony and you're like, didn't it tell you this thing that you obviously need to know? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that's interesting. Something that you touched upon uh, really well here is uh, the importance of the ceremonial container, right? In all these situations, you have a ceremonial container or some kind of a container um, and that's holding you, that's, um, you know, um, it's causing, it's like a crucible where something can melt and that molten thing can be held in that molten state. The moment you take the ceremonial container out, the moment you're back in the mundane world, now that molten object can't be held in that molten state. It needs to change state. And that's when, you know, all those defense mechanisms that for a moment had fallen away and I'm like, I'm a new person born again, whatnot. That again comes back in because Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're not in that ceremonial container anymore. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like you're a baby without skin and you were held by whatever it was the the ceremonial context, the, 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 that, that ego dissolution thing, but now um, yeah, this things come rushing in because they have to, because you yeah, would, you need to find new, new yarn yeah. to cover this thing. Yeah. And, and that takes time and is slow and probably done within a therapeutic context with someone you trust and ups and downs and whatever. Um, what about, so let's talk about, so this was interesting because our last interview, we talked a lot about EMDR and trauma and then you mentioned, you know, dissociation is something that, because I, I, I think I brought up in that interview, a lot of my patients have done, would say something like, well, I did EMDR and it didn't do anything. There was just eye movements and I felt sleepy. Yeah. So then you talked about, well, this is often what happens with when the person is dissociating and it takes a, a therapist that understands that to be able to even identify it because sometimes dissociation looks like something was successful, right? When yeah. someone is having like a very heightened sympathetic response and then stops and feels calm, it's yeah. like, oh, great, we, it worked. But really that person is 
even further down the ladder now. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And so sometimes yeah. you do work with dissociation before even doing EMDR, or maybe not even doing EMDR yeah. at all for, for many years or sessions. That's true. That's true. So I can give a quick, um, you know, kind of like what is dissociation? How does it start? And uh, what ends up happening? Um, now, I'll also to some of your, I like to use this example a little bit, but a bit of a uh, trigger warning because I'm going to just use a little bit of an abuse example just to like kind of like show what uh, what happens okay so say let's look at an example of say um, say a little boy say eight years old or something like that is uh, gets a really bad beating by um, his dad okay bad beating by his dad one night and he's crying and really hurt um, and next day now it's the next day and he's still in that you know cocktail of emotions anger hurt all of that but now he needs to go to school you know and this is pre-covid so no homeschooling we have to actually go to school um, and um, you know at school they have a personality of being a popular kid have a lot of friends he's like the class clown maybe right and um, but now he's not feeling it he's all hurt and still you know smarting from what happened last night but he can't go to school in that way he needs to go you know put on that put on that uh, you know self of his where he's the popular kid in the class clown so he does that he, he's like okay for me to do that what i need to do is i need to push aside this crying version of me because if i cry like that in class my friends are going to mock me or people are just going to not want to hang out with me anymore the image that i've created is going to dissolve so the child uh, pushes aside, imagines like a, like a door and pushes that crying eight-year-old version behind that door, locks it, and then puts on that class clown, popular kid uh, routine and self, goes out in the world, does his thing, okay? Um, what, they, what right there happened would be considered primary dissociation, where you have, um, we look at it in two parts. There are two, imagine two circles Okay, one is the circle of the daily living system. So it's all about functioning in daily life. Um, and you can call it like if it was, if you are a shop, it's the shop front, the front of the shop, right? How does it look? It looks nice. It looks inviting and all of that. The shop front, that's their daily living system. And the other circle is your defense mechanism. So defense mechanism is the back office, the, the back side of the, of the shop, right? And it's about like, um, you know, all your defenses, fight, flight, freeze, fawn, submit. Now, in a healthy uh, experience where there's not much dissociation, uh, what's happening is um, daily living system and defense mechanism, the defense world, they're intersecting. It's like those, it's imagined to be like two circles, like a Venn diagram, you know, two circles with a little bit of intersection happening, right? And that is considered healthy, where um, the person is able to organically switch between uh, defense and daily living and that the handover happens organically. So, you know, you are in daily living system, you're driving a car, suddenly someone cuts you, you get stressed, you go into defense, you're upset at this person, but 10 minutes later, you're back in daily living. So that's a really good handoff where, you know, it's a smooth, um, you know, handing off from one system to the other. Now, going back to that example with that kid, um, what has happened with that primary dissociation is when um, there is a split between the defense part and the daily living system part. Where the daily living system part starts to get fearful uh, or avoidant of the defense part. The belief being that if that part now comes out, it takes over, I don't know what's gonna come out. It's gonna be a crying child. It's gonna be, I don't know what, right? So imagine now that's single event trauma, but now imagine if this was happening on a regular basis, every third or fourth night, this boy keeps getting a beating. So what's gonna happen is more and more, the boy is going to then push aside that um, you know crying or hurt part of him so that he can go about his daily living system. So more and more, the daily living system now, we call it, it's a dissociative phobia or a dissociative fear the daily living system is now starting to get fearful of uh, the emotional part, the, the crying eight-year-old part. 
right? Like I can't deal with that. If that part shows up in at, at school, shit, like I'm gonna lose all my friends, right? Then starts to happen what we call secondary dissociation where now other parts, intermediary parts are coming in to maintain the separation between the daily living system and the emotional part. So now you have defense mechanisms and your protector parts. Say, say now the child is like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna become the best student in this whole school. You know, I'm gonna become a golden child. I'm gonna become this workaholic. I'm just gonna focus on studying, studying, studying and being really good, you know? So now that studying and that golden child workaholic protector, that becomes like an intermediary part that gets created as a way to maintain the separation between daily living and that emotional part. So that's secondary dissociation. When that keeps happening, now you throw in, uh, uh, say for example, disorganized attachment. Right? Disorganized attachment, what's happening, for example, is a part of the child is like, I want to strive to make my mom and dad proud. I want to do that to get their attention. I want their attention. So the seeking part of them, right? So golden child, attention seeking, people pleasing parts, for example. And then you have the parts who are the rejecting parts. You know, I hate my parents, you know, they're not safe, they're abusive. I hate my parents, they're not safe, abusive. That's the part, the angry part or the submit part or the depressed part. They are the parts who are wanting to like, you know, the angry parts often. They are the parts who want to uh, get away from the pet. So in the parts world itself now, what we are seeing is there are very contentious and opposite reactions. So then starts to happen. This is called tertiary dissociation, which is essentially the beginning of dissociative identity disorder is when now uh, one defense part, say the people pleasing part, cannot tolerate emotionally, cannot tolerate the angry part, the, the people hating part. And so these two now need to be kept separate. How does that happen? Through dissociative barriers, where now there are certain dissociative walls that the mind is creating as a way to compartmentalize now these two parts as well, who can't get along. So more and more the person, their mind starts to become like, uh, I use that analogy and with my clients, starts to become like, uh, the mailbox section in a condo you've seen right all these boxes mm -hmm. it becomes like that it's like these fragment 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 because the fragments can't get along with each other they are holding information that if realized by any one of the other parts would be too too destabilizing for that part and hence the information needs to be in a derealized state it needs to be in a separate derealized mm -hmm. state and that is essentially uh, what dissociation is trying to do um, you know, and then depending on how much trauma this person has, how much disorganized attachment this person has, we look at it as to like, okay, where they are at on the dissociative spectrum. So on one end, you have primary dissociation, which is like kind of like PTSD, the, just a singular separation. And on the more extreme end, you have tertiary dissociation, which is like dissociative identity disorder. And everything else lands in the middle in the spectrum. Mm. So in the third like third or tertiary dissociation, you may start to see people like a different personality being activated, like yeah. like a, a different persona kind of show yeah. up. Yeah, and, and DID uh, is a, because I do work with DID clients and um, it's, a very, it's a very fascinating, interesting uh, thing to work with. Um, it is not really like what they show in TV shows and movies where, oh, you have a killer part coming out and, you know, mm -hmm. killing everyone or anything like that. Um, people have a feeling, fear that DID is like, you know, certain, you know, uh, they're just flipping out and just suddenly doing crazy things and all of that. But that's not true. Um, often DID can be something that even the client, when they come to you, they may not know that they have DID or DID like experiences because DID is not so much about, you know, showing that, you know, how crazy I am and I'm changing, shifting. It's actually done as a way to hide things. It's more of a thing to hide, uh, you know, the trauma, hide the effects of the trauma and to appear as normal as possible. And so DID people on the outside, you know, I have worked with clients who are like doctors, big jobs in banks, from the outside, you cannot say, you, you're like, this person looks like a, in quotes, normal person, you know? Mm. I can't say that they have DID. 
it's when you start working with them over time, that's when you start seeing the switching happening. And then some clients do have more what we call florid switching, where they actually switch into a much younger child part. Uh, mm-hmm. The child part comes and sometimes I've had clients who have pre-verbal child parts come, who can't really talk to them. While other times it's not florid switching, where it's more of a, a passive influence from a part, where a part is you know sending in intrusive thoughts or um, telling the client, you know, increasing say suicidal ideation or making the client triggered by something. So, mm. you know, and mm. so, so not all DID clients, for example, have, you know, uh, alters with like names and full identities and all that. Mm. Um, some DID clients do have that, but not all. You can have a person who can be say diagnosed with DID and I don't do diagnoses by the way, can be say diagnosed with DID, but who doesn't have like parts with names Right. Like maybe just a dominant emotional state that's only allowed in that yeah. one kind of personality, quote unquote, or I, as you were speaking, I was relating it to like, I learned a second language as an adult. I learned Spanish when I was like 21 mm-hmm. and became fluent in it, which is not, which is different than being bilingual where you're learning. Like, yeah. I think you are bilingual with your I, second language for me i could say i'm trilingual so hindi <laughs> yeah. and bengali apart from english so three languages going and on. all three you learn like you In knew before the yeah. age of 20. yeah so but maybe you you experienced this but i i felt very strongly that there's a very small little mailbox in my brain for spanish um and there's because of the limitations of language and the way that you express yourself and the way you formulate sentences and even the cultural context in which I learned that there's something I can get into. And it takes a few days to, that's the whole like, oh, my language, my fluency is coming back. It's like, not really, you're just sort of stepping more into that mailbox and spending more time there. Um, And it would take a while to start to develop other parts of my personality into that mailbox, like certain sense of humor, puns, the, this flexibility and colorful language that, you know, more metaphorical language. And part of that's like learning the language skill, but it really felt like there was this little part of my brain mm-hmm. that contained the Spanish personality or the Spanish language skill. Yeah. And that's why translation is so hard because you're like flipping back and forth constantly. So it, it's something that requires a ton of energy for the brain. But just reminded me of that because, and I mean, there's no dissociation happening, which is the difference, I think. But there's, we have these personae for different situations. Like we call it the hats, you know, yeah. having to wear different hats. And um, there's lots of different things. It's not just a language. There's a lot of different things that can be incorporated within each kind of section of the brain like an actor may understand this much better because they're able to step into a completely different persona willingly um but that's very interesting like I have had patients who have been diagnosed with this who have who will will not remember and I think that's the scary thing too is that when they go into certain states it's not their primary state people will tell them that they entered it they won't they're um, I don't, I, get, I don't know. I think you have a term for it, but they're sort of like conscious working yeah. personality is not aware of these um, shifts. Yeah. And that can be scary because then you don't feel like you have conscious control necessarily. No. Um, typically um, the difference between say, so the hierarchy is say PTSD, complex PTSD, uh, DDNOS or OSTD, which just stands for dissociative disorder, not otherwise specified or uh, otherwise not specified dissociative disorder, and then DID. And um, I think the difference between DID and DDNOS is uh, essentially uh, time loss and uh, complete lack of co-consciousness. Time loss is when um, a client is having, you know, uh, big chunks of time they can't remember where another part is coming in. Um, and uh, lack of co-consciousness is their daily living system in structural dissociation theory, that part is often, I don't like that term so much, but some clients resonate with it. Uh, the apparently normal part whose job is to look normal, okay? Uh, the, the mask, right? Or what is it? Yeah, the, the, the persona. Yeah. yeah. So um, that part uh, in the old terminology it used to be called the host, host and alters. Now that's not used so much. 
anymore, but in the past that was the host part, you can call it. Um, that's the part that's losing time because that's the part that when another another part comes in to express or is coming in to help in that situation because there's some trigger that the host part or the ANP part or the adult part uh, is not able to tolerate this other part. And so needs to like, needs to kind of like get out, needs to kind of lose consciousness and this part comes in does this thing. So that's called lack of co-consciousness. Uh, and one thing that we start right away, we want to develop uh, is we want to develop uh, ANP co-consciousness where this present self is able to tolerate the parts that are switching in so that they're able to be you know, present or at least start to remember uh, what's happening. And that's what starts to reduce uh, the extent of dissociation um, mm. for that person. Yeah, and I think you have questionnaires and things, like how are you able to begin a journey with somebody who comes yeah. to your office? Maybe this person's coming for EMDR, like, oh, I know I have trauma. And then you start to recognize some yeah. signs. Yeah, so um, there is something that um, I administer to the clients called the MID, which stands for Multidimensional Inventory of Dissociation. It's a I think 200 something uh, question. Um, I give it an Excel format, 200 something question questionnaire list. And um, it's essentially looking at different um, experiences. Uh, let me see, I can maybe quickly show. I think I filled it out at one time. Yeah, I think I think I mm -hmm. uh, gave it to you for. I think um, yeah, some parts resonated not in a full way, but in like a um, yeah. probably more of a dorsal vagal way, like zoning yeah. out, t tuning out. Um, yeah, I just want to quickly grooming. Show. I think was that that was sort of like a, a um, grooming behaviors, like. Yeah picking at split ends or scab picking. Yeah, yeah. so it, this is kind of the form that I give them. And it has a lot of these questions, as you can see, it goes all the way down to 218 questions. And mm -hmm. you're essentially marking from zero to 10, where zero is never, 10 is always, so frequency, not intensity, uh, mm -hmm. as to how often does something like this happen in your entire lifetime. So not just in the last year, entire lifetime without not under the influence of alcohol or drugs uh, so stuff, stuff like having you know like hearing the voice of a child in your head having pain different pains like in this case pain in your genitals for no known medical reason another personality that sometimes takes over uh, trying to make someone jealous feeling that your mind or body has been taken over by a famous person uh, difficulties swallowing being puzzled by what you do or say so it's a, it's a very, um, there's an analysis part that comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very uh, comprehensive uh, look at, you know, uh, what's going on, kind of. Uh, Some of the questions are probably put in there to gauge, um, ac like, um, honesty or accuracy, right? Yeah. Like, some of them are yeah. not... Um... So there is a whole element on defensiveness. Um, okay. So there are questions. So there are questions, um, for example um you know um like do you feel that while doing something you kind of lose you know you you know you forget what you were doing or something like that now um that happens to every one of us that happens to every one of us to some degree and if a client has a part that has come on which doesn't want us to know this information they may just put a zero they may say no never happened this to me so in the analysis, that will, that will spark up as a red flag saying that there's higher defensiveness. Because mm -hmm. some of those questions, which is supposed to be something that happens regularly to most of us, this person has entered very low numbers or like zeros. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, with that, you kind of know that there's more defensiveness. Now, defensiveness is not like traditional therapy where this person is being difficult, defensive, it's more of an inner system that this inner system uh, is quite defended and doesn't um, want you to know uh, certain things. Um, maybe doesn't even want to know, let the adult part know about certain things. Right. And so mm -hmm. when we see higher defensive scores uh, and we see that the level of dissociation that's getting shown up in the scores is low, but defensiveness is high, it means like, hmm, could be higher dissociation. It's just that it's not being allowed right now to uh, 
uh, be shown in this. Uh, right, maybe, which is maybe why the jealousy questions in there, yeah. it's maybe more gauging, like, is this person have an accurate view of, of themselves or is willing to share that? I think I had high defensiveness. <laughs> so maybe <Absolutely>. I, <laughs> Um, and it just high defensiveness can often show up in the form of where client would have had difficulty opening up in mm. sessions or feeling like the sessions are not doing much for me uh, or it's not going, you know, it just it doesn't go deep enough. Uh, those yeah. kind of things can show up when there's higher defensiveness. And this thing uh, checks for a lot of different things. For example, uh, level of emotional, uh, emotional disturbance. Uh, PTSD like symptoms, uh, spacing out, time loss, intrusive thoughts, child parts, uh, angry parts showing up, all kinds of different and analysis, all of that gets separated out by sections and you get scores and all kinds of stuff. So it's a pretty good overview. Um, now this with that, it's not, doesn't mean that, okay, I know this person inside out. I can just do what I like now. No, it just, it's used, I use it as a way to give, give me a bird's eye view and to uh, know that, okay, the, if the dissociative score is high, to know that, okay, you know what, I can't just third, fourth session, I can't just start doing EMDR. Because oftentimes the client themselves want that. They're like, oh, come, well, let's do memory work. I'm coming to you for that. And here I have the numbers are kind of high. I'm like, hmm, no, I, I need to, I can't just do that. That won't be a good idea. Mm -hmm. And where do you then a thing to share as well with the MID? Um, it's like when clients ask me, Oh, can you share your findings? Uh, I have to be very cautious because um, some of the information may be too much for the adult part to hear. The adult part doesn't want to hear. If I tell the adult part, Oh, it looks like your child parts are showing up quite a bit. Adult, oh, I don't have child parts, or like they can get it, can be very triggering to go through the analysis. So often. Uh, I would keep the analysis for myself mostly and just, you know, keep that at the back of my mind, ask them some questions. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a bit of a tricky thing to share. Mm -hmm. I think that's true for many um, validated questionnaires where, mm -hmm. yeah, I think even just the act of filling them out can sometimes yeah, can, be yeah. because you're being asked things that, um, yeah, I definitely have had the experience personally. And then with, um, you know, doing an intake with a psychotherapist, with a new psychotherapist where you're, you're going through questions more quickly yeah. and then you're like, Ooh, wow. You know, just the, the act of being asked a question or contemplating it could be, could bring things up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, how might you start? Like, what would, I mean, we have about like 15 minutes left, but what would be like the, the journey for somebody who's, who's dealing with dissociation when they come in, like after they filled this out and you've determined that, okay, we're going to work with this, work with dis dissociation before we do anything else. Yeah. Um, is there a specific, specific sure. tools you use or how does that look? So, yeah. um, one of the things, so essentially what we are doing is there are certain pieces that become important. One is, uh, of course, um, grounding, stabilization, container, where we are trying to help the person be more present. Um, okay, in that, we're also looking at doing more and more time orientation. So whenever they're losing, whenever they're kind of getting sucked into old memories, and old traumas, um, helping them realize that they're an adult, they, it's 2021, you're here and now, look around. So that kind of a time orientation. Um, what we are also doing very important is uh, building affect tolerance. Affect tolerance is how much emotional charge, how much emotional activation can this adult or ANP or host, whatever that is, the adult part, how much can the adult part hold without needing to flip out, without needing to have some other part come in and take over that, right? How much the adult can hold. And, Affect tolerance goes both ways. It's not just like difficult emotions like anger or sadness. It also goes with, uh, you know, joy and happiness and mm. relaxation and calm and things like that. Mm. So often these clients have very low calm tolerance in the sense that if you ask them to like be calm, they don't, they don't go into calm. They instead go into shutdown. They go into dissociation. They go into daydreaming. They go into like 
and spacing out. So mm-hmm. whenever they've gone for like mindfulness meditation, things like that, uh, sometimes they don't like it and other times they feel they're doing it okay. Uh, but on further inquiry, it seems like, and I asked them like, okay, when you did that mind, 12 week mindfulness thing uh, and you're meditating, how was that for you? They're like, it was okay. Um, and then I asked them, uh, when you were in that meditation state, could you, for example, feel your body? They're like, nope, can't feel my body. Um, okay. That was what they told me. I shouldn't be able to, my ego dissolved. Yeah, yeah but like, <laughs> I can't feel my body. Okay. Um, but not, but I'm like, okay, you may not feel your body, but if you consciously be like, okay, I want to see how my stomach is feeling. They're like, nope, completely mm-hmm. disconnect. Uh, numbness, uh, disconnection, uh, feeling very floaty. Um, not able to listen to in, uh, instructions sometimes mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff tell me that okay this person is not going into a calm mindful state they're actually going into a dissociative spaced out state so that means that we need to develop their calm tolerance how much calm can they tolerate there are different ways to do that one is actually a really uh, cool uh, healing coloring book that i am recommending people it's created by uh, Dr. Ellen Lachter, who's a EMDR therapist in the U.S. Um, for your uh, for your audience, I'll give you the links mm-hmm. um, that you can put, um, you know, for this stuff. And we also use a book called Coping with Trauma-Related Dissociation uh, by Kathy Steele and Suzette Boone. So it's a it's a it's a big fat book. It's um, it's not exactly a book. It's more like a course. Uh, and it's meant for clients with uh, dis- higher levels of dissociation. And it has chapter by chapter, it has uh, different skills that you're trying to build. Uh, it's a bit more heady. It's a bit more left brain. Um, so I typically like to ask my clients to get the book, use the book as kind of like a, another take, take a therapist home type of thing where you're using that as a way to do it over time and use the coloring book. Uh, the coloring book has a lot of wholesome images based on different sections, like safety, um, self-compassion, et cetera, different things. And like images of a mom hugging her child, um, mm-hmm. you know, grandma reading stories to kids. So for someone with that kind of attachment trauma causing dissociation, that stuff, those images can be quite triggering. Mm-hmm. So even though they're positive images, they can be quite t- triggering. So I asked them to basically, you know, color the books in um, in very small doses, like just color the edges for 10 minutes or five minutes, you know, um, and slowly do one drawing over a period of a month, you know. Mm. And what's happening then is the person is able to now tolerate that image. They're able to sit with that image, not freak out or not start crying or not having to close the book. Over time, they're able to tolerate. And so they're soaking in some of that subliminal messaging from that image, mm-hmm. right? And that's how a person develops affect tolerance. When affect tolerance starts to develop, then we can start doing this whole meeting place, meeting inner parts, that kind of stuff. Uh, Meeting, and we start with protector parts initially, manager, protector parts. Then we go on to more like emotional child parts and all that. And we, uh, with parts, we want to do time orientation, orienting all the parts to present time. We want to do unburdening. So if they're holding some, something heavy, we want to help them unburden that. Um, And we want to help improve communication, collaboration, and cooperation between the parts. So as that happens, and that can take a while, as that happens, um, when the parts are able to get along better and better, we then start doing little bits of memory work. So start more with present day stuff, like you know, little things that happen here and there, we do a bit of memory work, EMDR, uh, and then start going into childhood stuff. If the client is able to tolerate uh, and hold the emotional charge without, you know, completely dissociating. Mm-hmm. So I know that's a lot of information, mm-hmm. but that's kind of like in my head, at least that's kind of, and this is not linear. So it's not like one after another, but these are kind of the pieces I feel that needs to be incorporated. Mm-hmm. I like that. Yeah. I think that that resonates for, for me and people I know or work with who have dissociation trauma, who, yeah, you know, certain images would be triggering and it's interesting because like you use the example of mother and child Mm -hmm. this person when they actually have kids and have a wife who's interacting with the child that real life situation was very triggering Mm -hmm. and that actually 
was was really um not a good experience for the person I'm thinking of and I'm sure this is like a relatable experience for people who are relating to this conversation in general but because ultimately it's like what's wrong with me that I'm not happy for the birth of my child or for my the fact that my partner is so affectionate to our child you know um why is this like making me dissociate or feel irritated or want to just go work or um so that's really actually very powerful and I think like would you say that somebody could get the coloring book and expose themselves a little bit or would that that not be a good idea I feel they can do it by themselves just the important thing is to do it only little by little and Mm. and the coloring book has a lot of context so like for each section they have like a page where the person and it's written it's called a healing coloring book for um, uh, adults who have experienced child, childhood abuse so it's a very mm. specific uh, and it's all the images 100 images and they're all broken down by different concepts like safety stability etc and there's like a bit of a write-up before each drawing as to what this drawing is about what it tries to you know, kind of symbolize and things like that mm. so, yeah it can be mm. done um yeah and i would recommend small doses just a little bit not too much mm-hmm. um keeping in the window of tolerance it's good i hear willow in the background yeah, so yeah. I, I, <laughs> yeah. um but this is great calling me at any point yeah which was which will wrap up just but i think that's great because i think that somebody who has a lot of the symptoms that we've sort of like woven in and out right you know lack of joy maybe some some distress type anxiety symptoms, just the fatigue, the association, spending a lot of time um, identifying with the dorsal vagal state a lot, uh, loss of memory of their their past experiences, et cetera, or was aware of abuse that occurred. They may be like, okay, well, how could I DIY my way to healing? Or maybe I'll do ayahuasca or take a meditation course. And a lot of these things might just further mm-hmm. aggravate the dissociation, right? So something like, okay, well, if you want to dip your toes a bit this is maybe a better direction is to do some reading on this and understand that um calm tolerance is really important because Mm -hmm. if you start to do meditation yeah you know you may just end up spending 10 days silently dissociating which wouldn't be good yeah Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and yeah for highly dissociated people i typically don't recommend right away doing ayahuasca or anything like that Mm -hmm. Uh, why because um those kind of psychedelics can kind of pull them above their dissociative barriers and make them mm-hmm. realize things yeah. that is being kept away from them. And then that can be very, very like activating. Like it, it can blast through some of these dissociative walls that are there to prevent them yeah. from destabilize, getting destabilized by a lot of traumatic information from the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, psychedelics can really kind of like you know, take you above everything and let you see everything from a bird's eye view. And then you have a hard time after that. Right. And then when you go back down, yeah, down, you're like, like we've mentioned before, it's, you know, first of all, you have to trust the ceremonial context. And if that's, n- that's inadequate mm-hmm. for the person, um, could be really traumatizing in the moment. And then afterwards, um, there is, there's not always necessarily like an integration. And sometimes it's too much information depending on the level of dissociation, like you mentioned. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is great. Any last thoughts as you got your, your baby crying? You gotta go see, <laughs> she's so I gotta, cute. I gotta co-regulate. <laughs> yeah, like I gotta go uh, establish some secure attachment right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, this is this is great, and um, yeah, I, w- I would recommend uh, your audience to you know, um, yeah, check out more about polyvagal, check mm-hmm. out more about dissociation. Um, you know, um, there are certain books like, you know, if you have if you feel you have complex trauma, then there's the complex trauma workbook by Ariel Schwartz, Body Keeps the Score, any work by Peter Levine like Waking the Tiger, um, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, coping with trauma related dissociation if you feel you're losing time and all of that that is a good book as a way to you know just introduce you to some of these concepts um, mm-hmm. so there's yeah there's a lot of resources out there um, and you know um, and yeah and, and another thing is 
when you start, if you have had an experience where, okay, I've been to many therapists and it hasn't worked out, I would recommend checking out some of the resources, like educating yourself a little bit, and then asking some of these questions to your therapist and initial consult. Mm -hmm. If your therapist is like, you know, dissociation, what is that? That only happens to people who have car accidents. Stay away from that. They don't know what they're talking about. Right. So it's like, because if you are someone who has had some of these experiences and are, say, losing time, that's very normal. That's very normal. Uh, earlier, there was this idea that DID was very, very, very rare. But the more and more the work has been done through that, we see that it's a lot more common than what it is mm. uh, and a lot more hidden as well. Mm -hmm. um, so don't feel like you're weird or anything like that. A lot of people have that. I see a lot of people with this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a whole it's a longer process but there's a full-on pathway uh, a way to heal from it mm -hmm. yeah and this is I think the beauty of just more of this knowledge in psychotherapy that you can apply different you know because somebody may be coming to therapy for a completely different reason or different goal and then this is uncovered and so it's very helpful to be able to you know, and then they may be like, why am I not getting better with my cognitive behavior therapy that I've been doing? Or why did it do nothing for me? Um, and, you know, or why is meditation making me feel worse? Or these kind of things that someone may, you know, may just internalize and feel shameful about when in reality there's an explanation and there's a, yeah. a route to go down that can help. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Thank you so much, Anne. This is so great. Thanks Give so Willow much, a kiss Maria. for me. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah, love, love these uh, chats that we have. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.